All roads in Krishna consciousness lead to the same destiny. Not, not all roads in the world. That is a mit misconception. Yatra tat tatra pat. That all roads lead to the same destination. That's wrong. But in Krishna consciousness, it's true that all roads lead to Radhika. Because she's the origin, she's the fountainhead of spiritual love. So we always will go in and around Srimadhar Radhika. Radhika, Radhika, Radhika Nam. So very important. <laughs> So run, run. Hey! <laughs> Trouble man. Bridge! Barking in the class, not permitted. Huh? So, Srimata Radharani is the fountainhead, is the, the queen, she is the, she is the lover of Raja, the most beloved girl of Raja. And how can a girl of a village in India become important to Salvador in Colombia? Can you answer that question for me? Why a little beautiful girl in Brajamanda should be important in New York? Why is she more important than Miss Universe? Why is she more important than the richest person in the world? That question we have to answer. Ladini Shakti, Swarupa Shakti, Prema Mai, Shiradika. What is happening with this girl? Why is she driving us crazy? Why do we shave our heads, wearing robes, begging from door, door to door around the world for a little girl which appeared this world 5,000 years ago? I mean, you have to ask the question, are we all crazy? Did we all go completely nuts? Either we are nuts or something very special <coughs> is happening. <coughs> something so special that it deserves the fullest attention of every decent person who, we, who is blessed with some piety. <laughs> Guru Devatulananda used to say that, that the problem in this world nowadays, people are not religious. They don't have much piety left. They just calculate, hey, how much money do I get out of this? Some people may even calculate how much money they can make out of Radharani also. So the piety is required. You have to embrace the spiritual revelation of Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna and Radha in one person. You 
have to allow the sweetness of, you know, as far as Tatva is concerned, or Siddhanta. And we are not lacking philosophy. We are not lacking philosophy. We have plenty of philosophy. The Bhakti philosophy, in one sense, is more extensive than any other type of literature. But at the same time, the Bhakti philosophy, it is coming from a world of sweet faith. It doesn't come from logical <laughs> calculations. It doesn't come from defeat of Nyaya. Okay, we defeated all Nyaya philosophies. Now there's no other chance except pray to Radhika and Goranga. Like I was explaining yesterday, Krishna doesn't come upon us imposing himself. You see, imposing imposing yourself that is automatically creating a negative relationship whoever imposes himself on others is not highly appreciated but you may invite you may you may do what krishna does krishna says Sarva Dharma Paritya Jama Mikam Saranam Raja Antang Sarva Pape Bio Moksha Isyami Masucha. You may come. You are invited, my friend. Come to Vrindavan. Come to Vrindavan. This is the place of love. <coughs> hey, are you looking for love? Well, I guess so. Are you looking for power? Are you looking for mystic powers? Do you want to influence people's minds? Hypnotize them? Do you want to transfer people's money from their pocket into your pocket? Telekinesi. Huh? I can just influence your pocket and it wallet comes out, opens, bills are coming out, flying into my pocket, closing again, and empty wallet go back into your pocket. <coughs> hmm? You know that's Uri Gela, no? You've heard about Uri, Uri Gela. The spoon bender. Wow. Then they made the, uh, a movie called the wind bender, the fire bender, the air bender, the water bender. Now everything is being bent. Huh? So, are you interested in power? <coughs> Do you want to become a, a bamboo bender? Well, I know some bamboo benders. They make real nice furniture. They can make the bamboo round. So it's not impossible. <laughs> so what do you want with your life? Or you just want fame? Do you just want everybody come? Here he comes. Thanks for giving me some recognition. <laughs> so Krishna is asking you that question. You want love or you want money? Power, fame. Power is very easy to get, you know? <laughs> if you want power, you only need one little investment. Maybe like $200. How do you get power by $200? Can anybody tell me? Come on, smart guys. How, you, how do you get power by $200? Yes! You buy a pistol and everybody does what you say. Even people who are really, really tough. You'll do what I say? Huh? 
turn every big muscle man into a begging, begging little wretch when he sees a gun pointed at him. <coughs> so with $200 you can get power. And if you invest $2,000, I know some people, they invest <coughs> Three thousand million dollars every month. You know who they are? For their power? So much money they invest. You know who that? Who is that? Government. It's called the U.S. Army. They spend ninety percent of their revenue in the military. So you want to have power? You better invest in it. <coughs> like you want to compete with the U.S. Army? It's going to be a bit costly. Or you just chant Hare Krishna and then they can do whatever they want and you don't care. <coughs> you can defeat the entire U.S. Army just by chanting Hare Krishna. And if they arrest you, then you can still chant in your mind. Nobody knows what's going on in your mind. Mm -hmm. This is what power is all about. It's threatening people. If you threaten enough people, then you're very powerful. <coughs> That's why they say in Mexico, poor Mexicans so far away from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> hmm? Neighbors. <coughs> so God wants to see. You want the $200 power? You know, Usually if you want to get sex, it's a very difficult thing to get sex. But you can buy it. It's on the market, you can buy sex. And if you have a gun, you get to get it for free, you rape. That's why when the soldiers come in, they usually rape all the girls. Because they say the girls have no choice. They see the gun and then they don't resist to save their neck. So, is this what we want? Do you want to buy sex? Do you want to force sex? Do you want to elicit sex? Or are you looking for love? You see, these are the things we have to decide. And that's what Krishna wants you to decide. He wants you to decide, I want you, my Lord. Even if I have to walk on my knees and beg for your grace, whatever I have to do, Krishna, I will do. Krishna, don't forsake me. Yoga is for love. Yoga means union. But people don't care for union. They just for, care for union with money, union with power, union with, <coughs> with sex, union with, uh, with becoming the supreme. Nobody above me. Actually, the impersonalist idea of liberation is the exact opposition of union. They say, yes, we want to become one with everything, but there's nobody above me. <laughs> but that's not union. Union is to come close to the person you want to become close with and have one purpose. One heart and one soul, one mind. <coughs> you 
give up independent desires from Krishna. That makes you one with him. One in heart, one in soul, one in desire. But not one in identity. One in identity is not union. One in identity means exclusion. If I want to be one in identity with you, I want your identity to go down and to disappear. Or I say all our identities disappear. Maybe I'm not so cruel. Maybe I say I want to become one with you, Sridharmaj. But the problem is that you have to come down and disappear and I'll be there together with you as one. Huh? Or I say, okay, Sri Ramaj, I'm not that bad. You go down and I also go down and we become one in whatever amalgamated substance that would be. A devotee he wants to become one with the Lord, but the Lord remains the Lord and the devotee remains the devotee and they are one in purpose. Why can't people get, cannot get it? Why the whole world is impersonal? Because that's what, that's what they want. They don't want to serve. They, they just don't want it, the yoga. They make yoga in twisted and bent it into anything fits their idea. This yoga and that yoga, nada yoga, musical yoga. They have this yoga fair now in South India and they are presenting more yogas than you have ever heard before. <laughs> Even I, who am 40 years with the yogis, I found so many yogas there which I've never heard about. I have to look at the book, I forget them. But yoga means union, not union with, with some material thing. No. Yoga means union with the spiritual, you supreme divine plan. <coughs> That's what yoga means. If you want to know what's yoga, read the Bhagavad Gita and then practice inbound yoga. Then you can get yoga. Some people say, I want to be a yoga teacher. What do you mean? Now you're going to go to a, to a leg twisting school and you, you find out how to make your legs into a very nice pretzel. Huh? And maybe stand on the hand and the head. Is that what makes you a yogi? People love yoga because they think I'll become a yogi, yoga instructor, and then I can make money. And I don't have to get a job and I have no more boss. What better thing could be there than a yoga instructor? Now you can be a yoga instructor and have the right attitude and really want to help people, but the majority of the people who go for to become a yoga instructor, they don't even know what the word yoga means, nor do they care. They just say, okay, is it good for me? Yoga or Pilates, the big fashion of Pilates, anything new.
So we have something new for them. Oida. <laughs> Oida is higher than yoga. Because it is the welfare of your consciousness. It is going to the essence of you are conscious of something. You want to practice yoga? Yes. So why? What kind of desire is that in you which wants you to make yoga? Find out about that consciousness and what fulfillment is there for that consciousness. <coughs> what is the psychology, the perennial psychology of your original consciousness? That you have to figure out right now. Then you can figure out what is the well-being of your intelligence, your mind, your body, your relationships. That's why OIDA therapy is going, it's bound to be successful. <laughs> because the people want to know what about well-being. And this is the book of well-being. <coughs> this is the, the paradigm of well-being according to the psychological original impulses <coughs> given by consciousness. What is the original impulse when you get, when you take birth? Huh? When a baby cries, what's the first impulse? Milk. Milk and love. So the baby is very happy when it's in, on mother's chest. But after a while, if there's no milk, then even mother's chest is not good enough. Like some mothers, they don't have milk. Then they have to get the plastic bottle mother for the baby. Then the baby loves more the bottle than the mother. <laughs> oh, that bottle. Oh. Very sweet sun rays in the morning. So uh, here we have a little tremendous beast. That's how the helicopters were invented. So what is the choice? <laughs> there is only one choice, love. <coughs> and there's only one way to go to love, by love. And there's only one way to learn about love, <coughs> from somebody who has love. Does it make sense? So Srila Vyasa, Deva and Krishna, they have the topmost love. But they are all crazy about this little girl in Raj. So that's why we are also crazy about this little girl in Raj. Because Krishna and Vyasa Deva, they worship. You read Radha Sahasranam. Have you seen the thousand names of Radharani? Have you seen that? You can see that Srimata Radharani is all over the Vedas. Everywhere she's. Well, just the fact that she's called Ishvari. What more you want? You think Parvati is the supreme Ishvari? No. 
Look at that. Goloka Vindavan Parameshwari Srimad Radhika. She is even called Krishneshwari. And that's a tough one, no? Krishneshwari. <coughs> she controls Lord Krishna. When Radharani says right, Krishna can't say left. He has to say right. <coughs> Otherwise it would be meaningless to call her the Ishwari if she's not controlling anybody. <coughs> so we will finish our class this morning by reading the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a very special verse <coughs> this morning. Karmaniyasmin nanavase duma dumratmanam bhavan apayayati govinda padapatma savam vadu we have just begun the performance of this fruitive activity, a sacrificial fire. Without certainty of its result, due to the many imperfections in our actions, our bodies have become black from the smoke, but we are factually pleased by the nectar of the lotus feet of the personality of God at Govinda, which you are distributing. Well, this is Canto 1, Chapter 18, Text Number 12. Such a beautiful verse. I'm actually in love with the Srimad Bhagavatam. Every shloka like this is so heartfelt, deep. I will read it again. We have just begun the performance of this fruit of activity, a sacrificial fire, with out certainty of its results due to the many imperfection in our action that surely applies to all of our fire young yes our bodies have become black from the smoke but we are factually pleased by the nectar of the lotus feet of the personality of god and govinda which you are distributing so here a great devotee is approaching Sutta Goswami and is saying this now you please relate the Bhagavatam to us so we will be purified. Prabhupada explains the sacrificial fire kindled by the sages of Naimisharanya was certainly full of smoke and doubts because of so many flaws. The first flaw is that there is an acute scarcity of expert brahmanas able to carry out such performance successfully in the age of Kali. Any discrepancy in such sacrifices spoils the whole show and the result is uncertain. Like agriculture enterprises, the good, good result of tilling the paddy field depends on providential rain and therefore the result is uncertain. Similarly, performance of any kind of sacrifice in this age of Kali is also uncertain. Unscrupulous, greedy Brahmanas of the age of Kali induce the innocent public to such uncertain sacrifice, sacrificial shows without disclosing the scriptural injunction that the age of Kali there is no fruitful sacrificial performance but the sacrifice of the congregational chanting of the holy name of the Lord. This is what Salvador was saying this morning. He said, oh, I've seen big shows of the sacrifice. Big, big, they make it very nice. Oh, looking good, looking good. But this exactly, this is not, nobody tells people, this is not the sacrifice for this age. The sacrifice for this age is chanting the holy names of the Lord. <clears throat> chanting and distributing the holy names of the Lord. This is the sacrifice of this age. This is what keeps us together as devotees. Sutta Goswami was narrating the transcendental activities of the Lord 
before the congregation of sages and they were factually perceiving the results of hearing these transcendental activities. This is also a type of kirtan. When you give a class, it's also a kirtan. One can feel this practically as one can feel the results of eating food. Spiritual realization <laughs> acts in that way. The sages of Naimi Sharanya were practically sufferers from the smoke of a sacrificial fire and were doubtful about the results. But by hearing from a realized person like Sutta Goswami, they were fully satisfied. In the Brahma Vaivarta Purana, Vishnu tells Shiva that in the age of Kali, man full of anxieties of various kinds can vainly labor in fruitive activities and philosophical speculations. But when they are engaged in devotional service, the result is sure and certain, and there's no loss of energy. In other words, nothing performed for spiritual realization or for material benefit can be successful without the devotional service to the Lord. Vishnu tells Shiva that in the age of Kali, man full of anxieties of very various kinds vainly labor in fruitive activities and philosophical speculation. <coughs> the next verse is very famous. <laughs> the value of a moment's association with the devotee of the Lord cannot even be compared to the attainment of heavenly planets or liberation from matter. And what to speak of worldly benediction in the form of material prosperity, which are for those who are meant for death. <coughs> That's a classical shloka. Oh, you should memorize it. La yamal lavin napi naswargam napunar bavan bhagavat sangi sangasya marjanam kim utashisha. Please write for me on a piece of paper. I, I want to memorize this shloka. I did it once before, but it's gone. Oh, so my dear. <laughs> This is the issue here. Shema <laughs> Bhagavatam is the issue of do it or die. Sorry. Uh, uh, get your show together. It's all about the yajna of the age. The yajna of serving Krishna. Taking his holy name everywhere. Making everybody happy. That's what we live for. Therefore, I must honestly say that those Brahmins who don't give a lecture every day, I don't respect them very much. I mean, okay, sometimes you can't. You didn't find time, family business and this and that. But you have to give a class every day. Otherwise, nobody will believe in you. Nobody will think that you have something valuable to give. <laughs> you can't come with any story, Akshara, or nobody wants to listen and things like that. No, even if only your wife listens, that's already a something good, you know. But don't say, I don't preach every day. No, maybe if you listen to a class or two every day, maybe in that condition, you're not that often preaching yourself. It's possible. But you have to look, listen carefully. What your guru wants you to do, he wants you to preach. He wants you to give class. And he wants you to train others to give classes. Why do I say this? I want to save the temples. Because temples without people speaking the Bhagavatam, temples without the class of a Bhagavad Gita in the night, they're just useless buildings sucking the energy of light, electricity and water. and and giving no benefit to the people. I'm not interested in maintaining real estate. There is no real estate. Real estate is the biggest lie in the world because it's a false estate. Because you're gonna die and all is gonna go. So if you're selling real estate, you're selling lies. <coughs> Thank you.
Say, come and give me all your money and I give you a paper. And that paper says, the house and the land in this and this direction now belongs to, uh, to Pedro. He said, oh, so nice. Now I'm the owner. And Pedro can leave a paper. When I die, huh, then Felicia will get my land. But no Pedro, no Felicia, no the grandson, no the grandchild. Nobody's going to own any land in this world. It's only illusion. So it's real estate is false estate. <laughs> only your conception, your illusion, which makes such a thing feel like real. <laughs> Of course, most, most real estate anyway belongs to the bank. <laughs> and if you're dying and the papers are not all perfectly clear, then it belongs to the government. So what is yours, really? Nothing. Senketan Yagya is the, the Yagya, Yoga Union. That is the real spirit. And the holy name in Krishna is one. Therefore, when you chant the holy name, you are actually making this union possible. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's yoga. You just practice yoga if from the heart you were chanting. If you only were chanting like parrot, it's better than nothing. <laughs> hey! You had lost your stick, probably. They don't believe in hands, they only believe in sticks. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they don't believe in the big sticks. They believe in the small sticks, because the small stick is, is fast. A big stick, they know, they can run away from. Before you lift your big stick, they're gone. Yes, that, that's, that's a stick they, they have some respect. <laughs> Estaban haciendo yoga, pero no durante la clase. Está mal planificado. This is our process, which we have received from the Srimad Bhagavatam by the grace of Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, when we chant, we should chant, Oh my Lord, please let me be an instrument of your love. Oh my Lord Krishna, please let me be an instrument of your love. This is my only real hope of my life. Let me be an instrument of your love. And that translation is actually, you know, it's up to him. Please let me be an instrument of your love. That depends whether he wants to and it depends on whether you want to. So you have to want to say, oh my Lord, I want to be an instrument of your love. Now if you say that but you don't mean it, what about that? You say it, oh my Lord, let me be an instrument of your love. And then the next moment the temple commander says, can you please help me out here? And you say, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm so busy praying, you know, for service. I'm so busy, I can't do any service. 